Okay, good, good morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's really my pleasure this morning to welcome uh, my long-term collaborator and friend, Dr. Professor Christoph Nienaber, who's coming to us from the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, England. And he was previously the chair of internal medicine and cardiology at University Medical Center in Rostock. He's an internationally recognized expert on aortic dissection and aortic disease and is one of the co-founders of our IRAD group. Uh, he's pioneered many of the endovascular techniques for treatment of aortic disease, which we're going to hear about today. He's led many of these trials and lectured around the world, published over 500 papers. So we've been talking about having him here for many years. I'm glad uh, it finally worked out. Welcome, Krista. Thank you, Kevin, for this nice introduction. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends. It is really a pleasure for me to finally make it here to Minneapolis upon invitation by Kevin. Uh, we know each other for a long time since the inception of IRA, the International Registry of Aortic Dissection, which was founded and inaugurated in 1996, I believe, with Eric and uh, Kim Eagle. And from then on, I think you were one of the early adopters, the early collaborators in this network, and we are really all together very proud of the output that IRAD could generate over the years. A couple of important papers, a lot of observational evidence of what's going on with aortic disease. And the reason why I, as an, uh, as an internist and cardiologist, was attracted by um, aortic conditions was basically my experience in my early years, in my early professional years, that we couldn't really properly diagnose these patients that came in with crushing chest pain. And uh, more importantly, we couldn't even treat them. The surgeons, the cardiac surgeons, took on type B dissection early on. I remember that 50% of those patients died from complications or during the operation. And if you look back now, 25 years or so, you cannot imagine what, what happened only a quarter of a century ago with these patients. Today, we have protocols and algorithms how to treat, to diagnose, and to treat them. But at the time, it was basically an experimental approach to any of these patients that came in occasionally uh, and uh, needed to be diagnosed. Diagnostics of type B dissection or type A dissection usually happen when I started in the cath lab and we came across these patients in the cath lab that were basically diagnosed uh, thinking of coronary issues or so, and we ended up in a false lumen and dis uh, dissected the, case, uh, the, the patient even further if you were not aware of the problem. That's why I was, or how I was introduced to aortic dissection, which at the time was not the typical territory a cardiologist would, would be feeling comfortable in. Today, my task is to talk about endovascular management of these patients because we believe, the community believes that endovascular management particularly in distal dissection, is the way to go, and I'm going to elaborate on this in the next uh, couple of minutes. And then, of course, the ascending aorta is an interesting target also for endovascular treatment, which is at this stage experimental, but there is a lot of reason to consider this seriously as far uh, as anatomy is concerned. But let me start with this uh, demographic outlook. This is data from Japan that tell us that all sorts of aortic conditions, acute, chronic, et cetera, will be increasingly seen in our clinics, in our hospitals, because of the demographic factor, because of better diagnostics, and of course, the aging population. So we will be confronted, confronted with more patients with aortic conditions in the near future. And it's probably a right thing to do to form groups and pressure groups to not only increase awareness of these conditions, but also to manage these patients better with specialized uh, experts. Here's a, a case that I wanted to introduce to you and show you that went into this publication from 1999 when we reported our first 12 patients treated with uh, an endograft in type B dissection. This is a patient, one of the, first, the early patients, and you can see here what happened. The diverted flow to the false lumen and to the true lumen is seen here on this uh, gadolinium MR scan. And a relatively stiff, non-compliant stent graft was inserted here in order to close 
the NT to the fourth lumen and direct the flow only to the two lumen. This is the concept behind this endovascular approach and dissection. And this early case uh, is a patient who is still alive. In the meantime, he got various other repairs, a second aortic valve and distal repair to his uh, enlarging false lumen at the level of the abdominal aorta. So it's a, a chronic case now, but he was managed in the subacute phase with this uh, early generation stent graft successfully. And as I said, it's still alive today. These two papers, both of them were published in one, one issue of the New England Journal, reported on 12 and 19 patients from Stanford, 12 patients from us, um, and 19 patients from Stanford that basically showed uh, exactly the same outcome with a relatively quick and safe procedure, quick recovery. And as a conclusion of this quick recovery and a low mortality or basically no mortality, Open surgery in this condition has been abandoned ever since, in most cases. Uh, in the meantime, 15 years later, uh, the guidelines have picked up uh, this approach in type B dissection. And in the European, I'm quoting here only the European guidelines from 2014, you can justify endovascular procedures in complicated as well as in uncomplicated type B dissection, uncomplicated meaning no evidence of imminent rupture or ongoing malperfusion. So these patients can be treated in experienced hands with a relatively low um, complication rate successfully in an attempt to stabilize their aorta. Here's a case. I brought you this case from recently. It's a typical type B case managed by endovascular intervention. You see the diagnostic scan here with a compressed true lumen and a perfused false lumen. The patient at this time didn't show any symptoms. He would have been considered a stable or uncomplicated type B dissection. You see the order is not enlarged yet. No clinical signs of mild perfusion. There's enough flow in the true lumen to justify this uh, um, asymptomatic state. But the patient underwent a procedure, as you can see here. The true lumen has been opened up. The false lumen is thrombosed. And the perfusion to the side is, of course, improved, as you can see here, uh, thanks to the addition of a open stent graft, uh, open stent in the distal part of the grafted segment of the aorta. The proximal, of course, is a graft. The distal is an open stent configuration that allows flow to the side branches of the abdominal aorta, as you can see here very nicely. So this is our approach. And here's another case. Our default procedure today would be in a type B dissection, irrespective of symptoms or uh, no symptoms, basically a bypass, a revask procedure to the left subclavian artery. In the second step, an occluder to the orifice of the left subclavian artery, as you can see here. Finally, a proximal stent graft placed here from the left carotid down to here. Sometimes the extension of an open stent configuration in order to realign the lamella better and improve mild perfusion issues distally. And finally, on the way out, we would also take care of the distal reentry site, and, and as in this case, patch up the reentry site in the left iliac artery. So this would be our standard procedure today, and probably in the near future. Um, the discussion about indications is ongoing, as you know. Let me introduce you in the next few minutes to our personal so-called local pragmatic classification, which we believe uh, is very useful in the clinical, in the clinical arena. Any kind of complicated acute aortic syndrome is identified by either the location, which could be even in the, in the proximal uh, aorta, the ascend, any kind of ascending dissection would be considered a complicated aortic syndrome. Any kind of mild perfusion, regardless of the classic type A or type B, would be a complicated aortic syndrome. And of course, any evidence of an imminent rupture as uh, seen with uh, extra aortic blood collection, would also indicate urgency and would qualify for complicated dissection. These cases need either surgical or endovascular immediate attention, I'd say. Here's a typical case of a type B dissection with small perfusion. <coughs> These cases cannot wait. They need to be addressed immediately and should be uh, taken care of by an experienced team that is fit to <coughs> analyze the problem, 
and treat it with an endovascular approach to the true lumen, the classic approach in the true lumen. There is, in most cases, no need for any fenestration maneuvers anymore. This is the latest publication from, I think, Atlanta, showing that these patients with complicated diabetes actually benefit from this intervention in terms of prognosis. Their long-term outlook is excellent. They stabilize after initial risk period and, and enjoy a relatively stable uh, outcome with no attrition, no further mortality in the next five years to come. This data has been shown by various groups, including ours, and basically uh, summarizes that these patients, without any level level one data, any randomized trials should be subjected to this endovascular approach. IRAT, and I come back to IRAT in the uh, various stages of my presentation today, IRAT had already in 2006 identified high-risk type B patients and lower-risk type B patients. We have just addressed these patients with mild perfusion in the last couple of slides, but those lower-risk patients with type B dissection do not actually have a low risk. If you look at the outcome data here from IRAT, after five years, there's a 42% average mortality in these so-called stable or low risk or uncomplicated type B dissection. It's something to consider seriously. We now believe that we shouldn't call them any more uncomplicated, even if they don't have symptoms. We call them patients that should be evaluated for high-risk features, and those high-risk features uh, are listed here. If the patient even if clinically stable and with no evidence of mild perfusion, cannot be controlled in terms of his blood pressure, or if he experiences repetitive episodes or recurrent episodes of pain in the first two weeks or so, <coughs> these two features are already clinical high-risk features that identify a patient at risk for early complications or mortality. Similarly, early expansion of the false lumen, partial false lumen thrombosis, a single entry tear, bigger than 10 millimeters in diameter, true lumen collapse, as we have seen on that other example, or evidence of ongoing inflammation in the false lumen. Identify patients at high risk, regardless of their clinical presentation. Data originate from IRAD. IRAD could show that refractory pain or hypertension, patients that cannot really be successfully controlled with medication, are at high risk for complications uh, in hospital and after um, hospital discharge and should be considered high risk. You can treat these patients successfully and consider them com complicated as in the classical differentiation between complicated and uncomplicated diabetes. From Korea and as well as from IRAD, we know that early expansion and early increasing diameter of the false lumen is identifying patients at risk for rupture and sudden death from rupture. Patients Need, the, the conclusion of this observational evidence from Korea is basically that a patient should be followed prior to discharge with a type B dissection with a second or even a third CT before you make a diagnosis of a chronic or of a stable type B dissection, relatively stable dissection, without any evidence of early expansion. If you see at the discharge CT at seven or 10 days an early expansion, like on this example here, risks are high for this patient to die, he will identify himself as a red group here with a high mortality in the uh, years to come from rupture, from early expansion, identified by early expansion. So the least you can do for a patient is, of course, and I don't have to tell you that, but for the community is to follow the patient prior to discharge with the second CT scan. I mentioned partial, partial false lumen thrombosis. This evidence of partial false lumen thrombosis, like shown in this, subacute chronic type B dissection heralds ongoing inflammation. And in IRAT, based on the number of cases that we could follow, uh, this feature was identified as the high risk feature. Higher risk for mortality than complete false lumen thrombosis, obviously, or complete false lumen flow with no evidence of partial false lumen thrombosis. So this is basically, as it turned out later, a correlate on a, of an ongoing mural inflammation uh, at the level of a dissected aorta. So to identify this sign, I think, seems prognostically important and should not be overseen. Similarly, a large entry tear identified by any kind of imaging modality, and this is an example of TOE image, TEE image, any kind of large entry tear, particularly single large entry tears, again, heralds 
high risk because of a large inflow into the false lumen, probably less uh, outflow and an elevated diastolic pressure in the false lumen, which all correlates with a bad outcome. So this is just another correlate of this condition. Patients with large empty tears, particularly single empty tears, need to be treated successfully by either surgery or by endovascular means. In other words, this empty tear needs to be sealed and closed or uh, excised. I mentioned aortic inflammation. Now with access to PET-CT, it's relatively easy to identify ongoing inflammation in the wall. This is an image uh, after after uh, FTG, a glucose injection that shows you an elevated metabolic activity in the area of the affected dissected uh, aorta in a scenario of a type B dissection. You see the large empty tear. Again, this is chronic state, partial full lumen thrombosis, ongoing inflammation, which basically succeeded after stenting, this pacifying maneuver with a stent that normalized, obviously, the metabolic activity, the enhanced activity in the, uh, in the dissected segment, went along with a normalization of biological parameters such as D-dimers that came back to normal and platelet counts that also increased to normal levels after this procedure was performed. So in other words, ongoing inflammation, which can now be picked up, is another bad actor and identifies a patient that we think is at higher risk. Uh, uh, Kevin also kind to mention one of the studies that I was involved in, and one of these studies was the so-called INSTED trial that looked at patients with features, with clinical features of stable or uncomplicated diabetes section. However, some of these patients had high-risk features, which we didn't identify at the time. Uh, what I want to say is that we could show with a randomized approach that patients that were subjected to stenting enjoyed a stable long-term outcome as compared to the control group under medical management only that had a relatively high conversion rate and sudden rupture rate over five years or six years uh, of follow-up, substantiating and underlining the need for an early or the benefit of an early intervention, even in clinically silent or so-called uncomplicated diabetes section. The reason for this is false lumen thrombosis, which we saw in 91% of cases with such an intervention, as compared to only 22% in the non-stented uh, control group, and evidence of remodeling in almost 80% of these patients, as compared to only 10% spontaneous remodeling in patients that are under medical management. What you can expect is that these patients under medical management show an expansion of their false lumen over long term, resulting in aneurysmal degeneration and difficult to treat long term uh, anatomic um, features of the aorta if the patient survives and doesn't rupture in the meantime. Uh, we heard yesterday evening that now technology is advancing, that even these chronic aneurysmal type B dissections or type A dissection can be addressed with endovascular means. Um, I'm not going to talk about this much, but there is already some technology on the horizon that can actually address these long-term late changes after dissection. We think that that should be avoided by intervening even in stable patients early on to prevent this aneurysmal degeneration long term. The data are pretty consistent. This is the instead data that I just show, uh, showed you before. Uh, similar data, observation data have been generated in IRAT. Uh, again, after two years, obviously, there is an advantage of an endovascular approach in these patients with type B dissection. Another randomized trial didn't show any difference in the first year, but there's only one year follow-up. Another registry from China showed a similar observation uh, evidence of an edge for endovascular treated type B dissections, irrespective of clinical presentation. So the data are pretty consistent that uh, endovascular treatment in these patients uh, creates a stable environment, promotes thrombosis and eventually successful remodeling. Another example from Boston published uh, last, no, a couple of years ago, again showing exactly after two years the advantage of a scaffolding procedure in an uncomplicated set of patients with sub section as compared to the natural history. So it's consistent evidence that obviously the investment of a stent graft, even in a stable sub patient, is uh, justified and benefits 
uh, with a long-term stable outcome in these patients. Uh, the, I mentioned the term remodeling. Remodeling is basically the stabilization of the fold stubin due to uh, lack of pressure in the fold stubin as soon or as long as the fold stubin is thrombosed. There is no wall pressure and wall stress on the outer wall of the fold stubin, which eventually leads to remodeling. So remodeling needs to be achieved, and most likely by stenting or stent grafting, as compared to patients that do not have remodeling, of course, the outcome is quite different. This is independent data from other groups, supported by the observation in IRA that uh, a complete fold stubin thrombosis, again, has an odds ratio of more than five in favor of a stable long-term outcome. This is not yet published, uh, but uh, the other um, two publications are in, in public domain. So with regard to uncomplicated diabetes dissection, a term that's still used in the literature, I believe that is a clearly a misnomer, uh, a name that does not suit what it refers to, because we can identify in these clinically uncomplicated diabetes dissections any uh, a number of high-risk features that we, I think, should identify prior to making a judgment if we're dealing with a stable patient that can be left alone on medication. Again, there is a few patients that do not have these high-risk features and that seem to be benign. What are we going to do with them? Uh, I think it is a good idea, and we do that in our current practice, to subject them to a risk calculator. There is a published risk calculator from Stanford available that you can basically use uh, to calculate the estimated risk of aortic or vascular complications in the near future. This benign-looking type B dissection was subjected to this calculation uh, with uh, parameters such as the circumference of the false lumen, the maximum aortic diameter, the number of aortic intercostal arteries that are involved in the process, and side branches from the false lumen. These simply to achieve or to, uh, to uh, measure parameters go into this algorithm. And this patient with this particular feature, he ended up with a 22% probability of dying from aortic complications in the next 24 months, although he was initially considered to be an uncomplicated diabetes. Uh, Actually, I think this needs to be validated pro prospectively. Are we participating in this validation process? But I think it's helpful to, uh, to help uh, the patient, his family, and referring colleagues to um, understand the problems that are likely to occur in the near future. Let's move on to the ascending aorta. The ascending aorta is a difficult territory, and over more than 200 years, 250 years, uh, this problem of type A dissection that usually leads to death, to immediate death, has been described in very prominent patients such as King George II, who uh, was found to have died from a tear in the ascending aorta and from pericardial uh, effusion. Oops. Um, this is an interesting target, and the classic treatment today, of course, as you all know, is immediate swift surgical repair and replacement of the ascending aorta. Uh, as I'm I'm supposed to talk a little bit about endovascular approaches even to the ascending aorta. I'm just going to show you the environment we and you are working in today, which allows us to do all sorts of interesting procedures in the ascending as well as in the descending thoracic aorta. This is a patient that underwent a hybrid procedure with a surgical approach and the rerouting of the ascending aorta as fibrance to the to the uh, Head to, to the head vessels originating from the ascending aorta and then sending of the arch and the descending aorta. All this can be done combined in a hybrid approach, in a hybrid environment, which is this hybrid theater that allows surgical sterility and a, and a surgical environment with the combination of imaging and overlay imaging and all sorts of uh, technical procedures that enable combined approaches. We see here valves, clips, stent grafts sitting here on the shelf. All, all, all these features are used in this environment in our place in, in, in the uh, Brompton Hospital. Before we actually approach the ascending aorta, I think it is important to mention the pioneering work of Tim Tudor, who basically 
had the idea, the first person who had the idea of Cybranch technology, which is, which is now necessary for all sorts of interventions in the arch and in the ascending aorta, and also in the abdominal aorta. This concept has been refined numerous times. Various groups and companies have picked up this idea and developed modern uh, devices that enable us to approach the arch and the ascending aorta. Just another example from two different manufacturers that basically uh, refer to Chuta's idea and, of course, expand the indications of interventions uh, to the arch, to the ascending aorta, possibly dissection specific devices, um, and, of course, type A dissection may come into play to be treated with endoscopy. <coughs> Here's another example of a procedure that involves such a side branch device, uh, which allows an intervention without thoracotomy, of course. The selection of patient is key. Uh, according to our understanding, this is only uh, an option for patients that are no candidates for open surgical repair at the present time, uh, and is still in the experimental phase and the early uh, evolution. There is a move towards simplified devices that tackle the arch. This is a, a new device that's becoming available in Europe that allows a more simplified approach to any kind of arch intervention. And of course, with the access to the anonymous artery, it would avoid any kind of thoracotomy or rerouting procedure to the ascending aorta. All this is coming, and even a combination with a valve has been described in recent, uh, in recent publications. Uh, this is an unwanted uh, end result of an arch intervention with a side branch technology that ended up with a valve because of a laceration in the ascending aorta and a, and a um, basically an injury to the to one of the aortic leaflets that ended up in huge uh, aortic regurgitation <coughs> that could only be tackled by uh, an Edwards valve at the end. The classic, of course, the classic procedure, the classic uh, therapeutic approach to the ascending aorta is still open surgery. Uh, I wanted to share this data here from IRAD with you that the, surgeons, the cardiac surgeons are actually doing a fantastic job improving the acceptance rate of any kind of type A dissection to 90%. A few years uh, earlier, I think this was in the late 90s, early 2000s, the acceptance rate was only 80%. Despite this increasing acceptance rate for type A dissection, the mortality is on the, on the way down, but still in the range of about 20, 22% in centers that participated in the IRAD registry. So there's still a room for improvement and probably uh, room for end of us to approach. But before I come to this final point of my presentation, I wanted to share this increasing, this decreasing mortality in IRAD over the last couple of years in type A dissection with you. We are now in specialized centers down to 12% mortality in type A, probably due to improving technology, better teams, better skills more use of uh, valve sparing operations in the last couple of years, and uh, more frequent use of anti-grade uh, cerebral perfusion, as shown here, again, from, from centers that participate in the International Registry of Aortic Dissection. And of course, improved uh, technology stimulated uh, by the invention of an elephant trunk here by Hans Borg from 25 years ago. All these uh, improvements have probably contributed to this decreasing mortality in type A dissection. I don't want to indulge too much on this, but there is improving technology available at the hands of our cardiac surgeons that can basically tackle type A dissection in a more complete way to avoid later complications. But the ultimate goal probably is to avoid, particularly in very old patient to avoid open surgery in type A dissection. And this is an example that I wanted to show with you. You probably have recognized Professor DeBakey, who himself suffered from a DeBakey II dissection at age 95. It was initially thought that he was suffering from, a, from, a, from an acute <laughs> MI, but it turned out to be a DeBakey type II dissection in the ascending aorta. The tear was typically located here. It took him and his family four weeks to decide that he should undergo surgery, and he finally found the surgeon, his, his uh, former uh, partner, George Nunn, who operated on him. 
and he survived. And I had the privilege to meet him <coughs> after his surgery. He was still in his wheelchair here, as you can see. And he told me a couple of months before he died uh, that for these patients in his age, over 90, we should uh, think of a better approach. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, it really was a decisive moment in my career to meet this gentleman and to hear from him that he operates, you know, by a method that he promoted all his career long should be uh, replaced by another approach, uh, particularly in elderly patients if the anatomy allows it. And here is such a case that I came across soon after a type A dissection, the tear here in the ascending aorta. And uh, we elected in this case for various reasons, not only age but also comorbidity, uh, to stent this patient with a short stent. And the stent is shown here. A patient had survived, as you can see here, more than five years. And this stent in the ascending aorta basically promoted what I was talking about in the scenario of type B dissection, also in the proximal aorta. You see the stent is sitting here. The false lumen is thrombosed at discharge. The, des the descending aorta shows also dissection, of course, it is thrombosed. There's no flow anymore. And over the years, the aorta started to remodel completely. And after five years, as you can see here, there's no more evidence of any previous dissection in the descending aorta. And even the ascending <coughs> looks pretty OK. If you didn't know about the stent, you probably wouldn't suspect anything. So it shows, this one case shows that it works. It works if you can stimulate uh, remodeling, uh, the patient will enjoy a stable long-term outcome. In the ascending aorta, of course, the data are trickling in. The biggest series are from China. They showed exactly the same thing. They put stent graphs, basically homemade stent graphs, into the ascending aorta and triggered a remodeling process over the entire ascending and descending aorta. We have published our initial 12 cases of ascending interventions that were considered unfit for open surgery. We lost one patient on the table because of perforation of the left ventricle with a wire. Procedure was done initially in a catheter with a small II, and we basically lost sight of the tip of the catheter, uh, the tip of the um, wire, and perforated the left ventricle. And as a consequence of that, the patient eventually died a couple of days later. But this paper shows um, that it is feasible in some cases under certain conditions, but it's probably not ready for a broader application. The details are mentioned here, listed here. The Euroscore 2 in these patients was high, uh, prohibitively high. So they, these were patients that were not considered uh, fit for surgery. The mortality was. 8%, one of these 12 patients died. As I said, the procedural success was actually good in all others. Um, the proximal tear, the tear was located in the ascending aorta in a situation, in an anatomical location that allowed us to put a stent graft here. This is one of these examples. You see the entry here to the, to the dissection. This is a Cook device, seven, 77 millimeter long, that was placed across this entry tear, and you see the angiogrammy on the right-hand side, shows a decent result. Oops. The follow-up after 15 months, again, shows a reasonable result. It looks OK. But then, soon after, the patient came back with an erosion due to the rigidity of this relatively stiff stent graft. The proximal end was basically eroding the the previous landing zone, which is, of course, not healthy, and the patient was converted to open surgery, although he was considered at the time not a candidate for surgery. I wanted to show you this recently published uh, cartoon from one of the manufacturers that basically have found a solution to, these, to the rigidity of a stent graft, a classic stent graft. This gore stent has different features. It's very elastic, very pliable, and probably comfortable enough to address the problems of the ascending aorta, the hostile environment of the ascending aorta with the three-dimensional movement and rotation. is very difficult for a stent graft to not to be traumatic. 
but this graph obviously has features that allow us, hopefully in the near future, to use it in these uh, particular anatomies. It's on trial. The first couple of patients have been treated. I think the first one was a month ago in Houston by Dr. Um, Dr. Estrella. And obviously, the initial result was very, very good and promising. Here's a similar case uh, from our series that I'm going to share with you with a different approach. I mean, this is a similar anatomy as you've seen in the previous case. In this particular case, we elected, uh, again, an inoperable patient, we elected to use a different approach from the false lumen. The false lumen can also be used as an axis to dissection. We call it FLIRT, FLIRT for false lumen intervention to promote remodeling and thrombosis. Again, a couple of patients have been published uh, this year, and it shows you basically what we do with these patients. In case you remember, is a type A dissection, entry tear here close to the inanimate artery. In this case, we wanted to avoid a stem graft and rather tackle the false lumen by navigating a catheter into the false lumen through that entry tear, dropping a couple of coils to promote thrombosis in the space considered to be the false lumen, and then eventually topping it up with an occluder in order to isolate the false lumen completely from pressure and from flow. Here's the follow-up images after this intervention. Pre-procedure, you saw that before, flow in both compartments. Then the closure of the entry tear with an isolation of the false lumen completely, no flow, no communication any longer. And then after six months remodeling, is an almost normally appearing type, uh, proximal aorta, which uh, again suggests that the occluder and the promotion of thrombosis by, by coids did the job and helped the false lumen to remodel, the aorta to remodel. Here's another case of a type B dissection with a Lusoria anatomy. Similar problem. The type B was extended. There was uh, a chimney in order to protect the lusoria, and eventually at the end of the procedure, the false lumen was not completely from both, but there was flow in the leak, flow in the false lumen and the leak, obviously in a ruptured tear of the graft, which, uh, which, which prompted a secondary uh, procedure in order to promote false lumen complete from both, which you can, can see here. We addressed the false lumen from down below from a re-entry at the level of the iliac artery, left iliac artery, dropped some coils here at the previous uh, leakage site, and eventually an occluder in the distal part of the, in the more distal part of the false lumen, as you can see here, which altogether promoted thrombosis in the false lumen. Here you see the sequence of events from left to right. This is what's left after the secondary intervention to promote complete thrombosis, which we believe is essential to induce remodeling. Here's another case just to show you what you can do with this procedure. Type A dissection in a very sick and severely diseased patient with no access from down below, previous placement of bypasses to the femoral arteries. The type A dissection was addressed coming from the left brachial artery by using the similar, a similar concept, identify, initially identifying the entry tear which was a three, four, three to four millimeter entry above the, the right coronary artery. I'll show you in a second. This entry tear was navigated by use of a coronary catheter from the left arm. Again, coils were dropped into that space, evolving type A. And again, the finish was a, an ASD, no, so, sorry, a PFO occluder to seal this entry tear completely off. And as expected, after some time, you see nice remodeling results. The artifact of the occluder is seen here. The order is uh, appearing quite normally, and the false lumen is completely thrombosed. You see the artifact of the occluder right here very nicely. So we believe that this, this procedure, as an individualized ancillary procedure in some patients, is helpful promotes um, remodeling, of course, and 
is relatively safe. They didn't have any major complications with this approach in 10 patients that had been published earlier this year. All patients eventually ended up with complete false lumen thrombosis. It's just an example that the false lumen is sometimes also uh, worth a consideration in order to tackle these patients with chronic complications. Uh, in summary, uh, we could show that the true lumen area has increased after six months in these patients, and the total diameter of the aorta, the maximum diameter of the aorta, has subsequently decreased. So again, supporting the uh, beneficial effect in, in terms of promoting thrombosis and eventually long-term remodeling with this ancillary procedure. The critical question in our discussions with surgeons is always whether this technology can be brought forward and replace eventually uh, a classic endovascular bento procedure in the ascending aorta. This is a question that is always discussed. I personally uh, am skeptical. I came across this sketch from more than 10 years ago with an idea that went into some patent application with a valve anchored at the valve at the anal uh, level of the aortic valve, side branches attached to some graft structure. This is work in progress probably with some companies. It hasn't seen the day of light, although some authors are very hopeful that in almost 68% of their patients that they see um, when they evaluate the uh, CTs of these patients are probably candidates for such a procedure in the near future. I personally am, am more skeptical, but I came across this figure in a recent publication that they believe that more than half of these of their patients can be addressed with such an approach. Again, this is a slide that I saw on a meeting in 2006, again addressing the same question. Uh, I haven't seen anything uh, on the market yet or in preparation. People talk about this approach, but I personally think that uh, it is not ready for prime time. The endo banter is a feasible idea. It will not see the day of light soon. I believe that many, many of our colleagues are interested in it, but I'm skeptical, and I believe that uh, we won't see it very soon. I want to close my presentation without mentioning our team. This is a team in London that cooperates very closely between cardiac surgeons, vascular surgeons, uh, imaging experts, and cardiologists, and we basically meet every so often, twice a week on our cases, and we design a strategy for any given patient, considering all options from open surgery to endovascular, and of course, medical management in some cases. Thank you very much for your attention. Time for questions now. Chris, thank you for uh, lending us your substantial expertise, that was fantastic. I have two questions. The first is, so I think the message is that if you look carefully enough with serial imaging, that the vast majority of the patients with uh, type B dissection will have some high risk feature, and that the majority then are managed with an endovascular procedure plus medical management. So the the question is, um, how long do you wait to treat those patients? What's the time frame that you try and get them back to your center to treat? So that's question one. And question two involves your, your aortic center and, and your meeting with your colleagues. So we do a very good job of, in an acute situation, rounding up all the troops and, and, and uh, treating patients, but we've struggled with looking at cases on a prospective basis, on a regular basis. So can you tell us a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how often you meet, um, you know, how long are your meetings, who all is involved, because I, I think that's something that we, we, we need to do better. The, the Valve Center does a fantastic job of it, meeting on a weekly basis, but we've not uh, been quite as proactive. Well, we are Again, a meeting, as I said, we're meeting on a weekly basis. We invite our referring hospitals, uh, representative of the, these hospitals to our meeting. 
every uh, Wednesday afternoon from four to whenever it finishes, uh, usually around seven to eight or six, easily more than three hours. Uh, all cases are discussed in presence of surgeons, interventionalists, and of course the referring doctors that want to talk about a case or introduce a case or talk about logistic problems. So, so we see uh, at least representatives from four different hospitals every Wednesday. We also go out to these to various other hospitals and outreach clinics, and we send juniors to these out, outreach clinics in order to help them establish a pathway <coughs> for their dissection patient that they basically keep or that they uh, try to transfer to us immediately in, in case of emergency features. So the type A's basically are immediately referred. The type B's are usually kept in their local hospitals until we have seen the images and then we make a decision together whether we want to have them transferred over to us for treatment. We sometimes actually treat them in those hospitals and one of us goes over there and manages the case with them. So this is a very close-knit community that grew over probably six, seven years since the rotational service for West London for type A dissection was initiated uh, usually uh, mostly under the care of John Pepper, who initiated that collaboration a couple of years ago. But that was mainly for type A's. Now we're expanding this to the type B scenario, and this is one of my tasks there, to establish a network for referrals for type B dissection from the western part of the city. Uh, it requires a lot of interaction, a lot of phone calls, meetings on a weekly basis if possible. Uh, also protocols that have been exchanged between are referring, uh, referring hospitals and us. Uh, it's growing. It's not a, an on-off phenomenon. It's, it's growing. It needs personal interaction. It needs a lot of talking and meeting. But it seems to get better. The acceptance and the awareness is growing. The problem that we see is still in the in community hospitals that are further away and are not participating in this in this network that I was, talking, I was talking about. So we, we still come across patients that are sitting in hospitals um, for weeks with no referral, with no idea how to treat them eventually, and we are lucky to see them sometimes they're probably missing quite a lot. According to our estimation, we should see more of these patients, but they're probably not referred, so that needs to improve. And the first part of your question was relating to the protocol, how we manage a given patient uh, that ends up in our hospital with an acute problem, of course, we take care of them immediately and treat them. Uh, if, they so, if they have uh, features of malperfusion, for instance, then we wouldn't wait a day or so and rather take care of them with an endovascular approach. In patients that have high-risk features, uh, but no clinical need for immediate intervention because absence of malperfusion or no critical issues right away. These patients are scanned prior to discharge a second time, which is usually after eight days, nine days. If we see, and we carefully evaluate those scans for high risk features, if we see evidence of it, we would schedule the patient in the next couple of weeks for an elective procedure. <coughs> uh, if there is reservation to go ahead and endovascularly treat these patients, we always see everybody after three months even the non-stented patients, and would make a decision based on a follow-up scan at three months. This is at the end of the window of opportunity, as we call it, or window of plasticity, when you can successfully remodel the aorta. You shouldn't wait more than three months if you make a decision to go ahead and stent a patient, because beyond three months, the long-term outcome in terms of successful remodeling is a, is a little bit worse, as in the early three months. Uh, because the window of plasticity has probably closed after 90 days. So it's important for us to see everybody after three months again, irrespective of the initial treatment. That's basically the plan. In immediate decision whether you deal with a patient with complications, then of course you go ahead in the initial hospital, um, hospital admission. If there is no such urgency, we would scan the patient prior to discharge make a decision whether he qualifies for high risk, and then if yes, go ahead with a scheduled appointment a couple of weeks later, uh, basically a second admission for the treatment, 
And if he or she doesn't fulfill criteria of high risk, we see the patient after three months anyway and make a decision again at that, at that stage. So that's basically our timeline. And everybody, of course, gets medical management from day one. We've um, <clears throat> the we've basically embraced uh, on the debate E one um, approach as a debranching total arch with stent uh, in, in our practice, um, but we also have a, a stable of patients who've been tra treated more traditionally with uh, a tube graft uh, in the ascending aorta with a chronic dissection that may involve the, the arch. Uh, is there any data that suggests that uh, PET-FTG or others might be useful in um, intervening on some of these chronic uh, arch dissections besides the type B? The data you show was good for type B, but the arch is a little bit more complex. Right now, we, we just follow by CT scans and a threshold of reoperation or intervention is based on just growth and size. Are there any other predictors that you think based on um, had FTG that has a role in maybe intervening earlier. Were well, you talking about the problems after previous type A surgery with an ascending into position? Correct. Graft. Right, with a residual chronic dissection that is, you know, five and a half, six centimeters. Yeah, we intervene at five and a half centimeters electively. I think the high risk subset of these patients is those with entry tears at the level of the distal anastomosis or in the arch. If you see and if you can identify an entry tear at that level, a patient is set up for later complications. So these would be candidates that we could, that we would very carefully look after and try to identify early expansion, probably electively operate on them prior to 5.5 centimeters in order to, to avoid later complications. Is your approach to those patients more of a debranching approach now, or do you still go more with the uh, traditional, let's say, elephant trunk? Or well, our surgeons like the complete arch replacement with an elephant trunk. At least two of the two of the three most active aortic surgeons like that. And if the patient is referred to them, they will probably evaluate the patient for an elephant trunk, frozen elephant trunk. There's two models available in our environment. Both of them had pros and cons. Um, I'm not, probably should not talk about the surgical technique because I'm not a surgeon does to do it, but um, it's personal preference. One of the, these two like the, uh, um, the, the Japanese model, the, uh, what's it called? I forgot the name of it. And the other one is uh, the JOTEC model, uh, which has a shorter elephant trunk. It's probably a lower risk of spinal issues. But this is debatable. It's personal preference between the two surgeons. Thank you. One follow-on question that's not really related to your talk, but uh, and we spoke about it a little last night, but I still can't quite wrap my head around it. So we talked a little bit about uh, EVAR for infrarenal aortic aneurysm repair. Could you um, enlighten uh, our colleagues here as to what the decision of the, uh, uh, the NIH in, in the UK is regarding uh, standard infrarenal EVAR? Yeah, that's, that's really a shocker this summer. The National Institute of Clinical Excellence, NICE, uh, is an institute that basically uh, is important to commission procedures in the UK that are financed by tax money. The NHS is a global insurance for everybody, financed by tax money. And the NICE Institute is, a, is an institute that looks at data very uh, carefully and gives recommendations what particular procedures and what, what medical management should be commissioned and what, what should not be commissioned. And they came to the conclusion, analyzing the long-term outcome of uh, the EVAR trial, the DREAM trial, and the OVER trial on AAA EVAR uh, indications, and came to the conclusion that uh, an EVAR procedure is not cost-effective long-term, which resulted in a decommissioning of EVAR. There's only open surgery or medical management for, EVAR, for AAAs in the UK since July this summer. 
I think well, it was it was a shock for the community as well, and they tried to appeal on it to here a second time. Now the data speak for itself. <laughs> no way, no way back. So there won't be any financing of EVAR uh, in an NHS population. You have to pay for it if you want it, and to find a surgeon to put an EVAR in. Um. It's really an uproar. As a vascular medicine specialist, I take care of a lot of patients with aortitis, um, either it could be Takayasu or Janssen-Lateritis. How that would be different in terms of management? Do we, our approach has been to try to stabilize patients who can wait for a month or two with um, immunosuppressant therapy and then send them to surgery. That's the first question. The second quick question, um, we see also a lot of connective tissue dis disorder patients as well, too. Um, how is your approach to these patients? Do you test uh, genetic? Uh, do, you t do you send them for a genetic counselor all the time, or just there is a pre-test uh, probability that you look for, and then you test them for genetic testing? And how, how do you approach these patients? Yeah, you know, we, we submit uh, every patient with dissection for genetic testing, and we found a lot of acta tattoos already that on, appear to be completely normal on, on, on physical examination. You don't see any features of Marfan or Lloyd's Beats or something like that. And you, there's a high percentage of these patients that have an ACTA2 mutation. So we, we submit everybody to genetic testing. We have a lab in-house that is also commissioned to serve uh, parts of southern England. So we get also blood to be evaluated for other, for other hospitals. So that's basically part of the local routine to test everybody. How would that change your uh, management for the patient and or family members well, if it is positive? It would, if it is positive, uh, of course, uh, if a patient has a, has a um, hereditary tissue, connective tissue disease, he's usually not a candidate for, for endovascular treatment, if you wanted to, to hear that. Um, usually, if possible, a uh, patient is subjected to an elective surgical intervention Big time, of course, and Marfan sometimes get the whole aorta replaced, almost the whole aorta. Um, in emergency situations, we would not hesitate to put a stent in as a bridging procedure if necessary, but only as an emergency if, if there is no other option right away. Uh, in patients that had been operated and have Dacron patches in the aorta that can be used as a landing zone for a, another stent or so, it would be probably an option as well to use endovascular approaches in these patients, but not in a native, um, naive uh, Marfan patient, for instance. They would not do that. For patients with vasculitis, aortitis, yeah. is there a different approach uh, that you? No. Um, well, there's, there's so many question marks, we don't really know what to do with them. So we keep them under close surveillance, uh, we treat them as you do, anti-phlogistic uh, treatment, um, there's not much you can do about them and try to pacify the aorta as much as you can and operate if necessary at a lower threshold as long as you can keep the, the inflammation in check. I think we would probably wait at least three months prior to surgery on treatment. But there is no clear understanding. I mean, it's a little bit debatable. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, so do you... Does your PET CT, is that part of your algorithm then for a the so-called stable type B uh, di or uh, stable patients after uh, dissection? Is that yes. an official part of the yes. algorithm? Yes. And the presence of inflammation? So what we do is uh, at the three months follow-up timeline, we subject the patient to a PET CT rather than to a CT alert in order to pick this, what we consider a high-risk feature. There is a study that has been conducted in Belgium under the auspices of a uh, cardiac surgeon, uh, Dr. Sakali Hazan, uh, who basically has followed more than 200 patients with a PET-CT and is about to publish the results. And he can predict based on appearance of ongoing inflammation at three months or maybe a little bit later than three months, uh, a high risk of rupture. So based on that evidence, we're following that kind of logic and submit the patient at three months to PET CT rather than to a CT alone. But that changed just, just recently. That's an amazing talk. Thank you very much for a very inspiring data. Uh, 
I have a question. Uh, when when there is a patient with uh, type A acute type A detection coming to the hospital, uh, this is obviously an amazing picture of the of the team approach. Not proud. The problem is that usually this type of a, uh, meeting doesn't happen at 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. Uh, do you have uh, uh, some kind of organized uh, aortic call approach or team approach, let's say, that is always available to discuss the case, look at the images between cardiologist, vascular surgeon, cardiac surgeon, to actually uh, uh, choose the, the correct treatment? And uh, uh, obviously, that, uh, that, that always creates a, a lot of uh, call burden for the, for the team. And, uh, as we are building our aortic center, we, I'm, I'm curious to know what, uh, how you guys approach it. It's a very important question. Uh, thank you for this question. I have to go back a couple of years when John Pepper started this collaborative effort in London, comprising the hospitals, Harefield, which is a little bit uh, on the outside and the outskirts of West London, um, Hammersmith and the Brompton Hospital. These three hospitals decided eight years ago to cooperate and collaborate for the service of surgical treatment of type A dissection. And there is a rotational service. So every week, uh, one of these hospitals is on call for type A surgery. And these surgeries are only performed by dedicated aortic surgeons, not by a regular cardiac surgeon anymore. That has changed and has improved the outcome. Uh, there's no cardiologist involved uh, in the procedure in the beginning, and this is now changing because we want to expand to type B's as well. And of course, uh, the imaging was a problem initially because not, not every hospital had access to gated high quality CT in the middle of the night. So they got some crappy images sometimes and needed to be repeated by one of the centers that had gated images early on or could provide gated images early on. That, that is all normalized. So everybody has the same protocol of imaging called the radiologist and a cardiologist. Uh, sometimes a cardiologist or an interventional fellow is needed to put in a wire into the, into the true lumen prior to putting the patient on bypass so the surgeon in, intraoperatively can identify the true lumen absolutely 100% sure and find the way to put the elephant trunk into the true lumen, into the right lumen. That was a problem initially. So all these things have not been considered and put into a protocol. And in Harefield, in, Hamil in, in Hammersmith, and in Brompton, they're doing the same operation for the same uh, type A dissection acutely. So that has improved. Now the next big step would be to expand that to other conditions such as type B or intermural hematoma, which nobody really understands properly. So this is work in progress, to be honest. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> On the way out, we've got our sponsors today, Novartis and